Uh, the chemistry colloquium is normally held in the Schmidt Auditorium, which is about 50 meters from here. But every so often, we have a reason to move it over here. And that is, every two years, we have to celebrate a new Israeli Nobel laureate in chemistry. So we met here uh, two years ago to listen to Ada. And today, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker. And it is a double pleasure because it's the Gerhard Schmidt Memorial Lecture, which is an annual event for the Faculty of Chemistry. So let me say a few words about Gerhard Schmidt before introducing today's speaker. Gerhard Schmidt is here. He was born in Germany in 1919 to an educated family, highly educated family, and now uh, grew up mostly in Munich. In 1934, he realized he was Jewish. His father was uh, fired from work. He got into some uh, street fights and had to flee and move to Switzerland, and a couple years later moved to London, where he finished his high school education. Uh, and then I uh, started his academic career in 1938 to 1943. He got his BA in Oxford, 43 to 47. He obtained his PhD working with uh, Dorothy Hodgkin on X-ray crystallography of proteins. And that was uh, when he obtained his PhD. Now comes an interesting uh, section. In 1948, he has written to Ernst Erdmann, who was here at Weizmann, looking for a position. And he was offered a position. The funny part was that his list of publications then consisted of one paper, and he was not the first author. Probably today he would not be considered. Uh, he received the offer here, and uh, later Bergman testified that it was because he was impressed with his research proposal. So the proposal is important. Uh, Gerhard Schmidt's work was a combination of organic chemistry and crystallography, and over the next few years after joining here, he developed, the next 20 years, he developed uh, the main theme of his work, which is topochemistry, uh, where the nature of the crystal determines the kind of the, uh, chemical reaction that occurs or doesn't occur, and with some imagination, this is the precursor to today's supramolecular chemistry. Now, Schmidt's work defined or helped define directions of the Faculty of Chemistry here at Weizmann. And uh, if you want to look at some of my story of his biography, in 1967, he was the first chair of the newly formed Department of Chemistry. And a few years later, in 1970, when the was organized in our faculties, he was the first dean of the Faculty of Chemistry. He was also the director of the institute twice, from 59 to 69 and 69 to 70. These are dry facts, but here in the room, I assume uh, some of his students are still sitting and some of members of the family are still sitting here. And uh, some of his students, have quite a few students and postdocs and co-workers, three of them are active members of our faculty today, who are Leslie Zorovich, Meir Lahav, and Sipi Shaket, who was his last student. Now, Professor Schmidt would have been delighted to attend today's lecture and by way of introduction to our speaker, I would like to show uh, three pictures. This is a famous picture that was taken in 1952, and as some of you may recognize, it was taken by Rosalind Franklin, and that's the first evidence of the double helix structure of uh, uh, DNA. This is another picture, famous at Weizmann, which is an X-ray picture of the first crystals that Ada grew, and that was taken also in uh, 1980, so that's quite some time ago. And the third picture is this picture, which is a strange symmetry, and a note that uh, points out here that there is some strange symmetry there, and that will be uh, the nature of today's talk. A few biographical facts about Danny Schechtman. He got his BSc in Mechanical Engineering in 1966, MSc in Material Engineering in 1968, PhD in Material Engineering in 72, and joined the Department of Material Engineering in 1975. A pure case of inbreeding probably would not work at Weizmann either, uh, and uh, his entire career at that stage was at the Technion, uh, following uh, a postdoc, a uh, short postdoc at uh, White Patterson Air Force Base, and then in 1981 to 83, spent the sabbatical at Johns Hopkins and the uh, National Bureau of Standards, where the famous observations were made, and the rest is history. I will not tell you uh, how those uh, discoveries were accepted by the community. Before closing and uh, clearing the stage to Danny Shekhar, I want to show this picture. This is a picture of Menashe Tzadka. 
Menashe Tzadka was Danny's uh, physics teacher in high school, that's Brenner High School. And the reason I'm putting there, because he was my physics teacher also at Brenner High School, and also Tzipi Shaked and a few others. And I know today that there are several who graduated with Menashe Tzadka. One is Itzik Mawon in physics, Tzipi Shaked, myself, and now Danny. We're joining uh, you to this uh, important group. Physics teachers are very important. <laughs> Danny? Uh, one word about uh, Tzadka. Because I, I bring him as a wonderful example of a good teacher in the world. And I remember in one instance, um, Professor <laughs> Dr. Sadka, I think he was a doctor. He is he's still alive with Bill, an amazing person. He drew a, um, a series of um, resistors on the, uh, on the blackboard, connecting different ways, and he asked me to come to the board and solve the question, what is the resistivity from this end to this end? And there was a, a bundle of registers. And he solved it on the board. And then he said, Dan Nevin Physica. <laughs> now, that was 55 years ago. And I still remember it. So, for the teachers amongst you, praise your students when deserved, because it's such an encouragement. So the talk today is uh, about the discovery of quasi-periodic materials. And this is the way I spell my name. And other people have other ideas about it sometimes. <laughs> I added a few slides this morning to this talk once I understood uh, this occasion. And I will say a few words about crystallography the early years. We'll start with August Brave. Guess what month he was born in? And uh, he is the one, he was amazing. He first uh, divided the uh, 14 Bravais lattices, and he also said that atoms in a crystal will be about one angstrom apart, which is true, without any, any experimental evidence for that. So his thoughts. And, and mathematical development of the 14 Bravais lattice is an amazing achievement. Uh, he uh, published it in uh, the year 1850. Röntgen came next, and he provided us with an X-ray tube, and uh, that uh, provided a tool for X-ray uh, crystallography. This was in uh, 1985. And he was the first Nobel laureate in physics in 1901. Next important in crystallography is uh, von Laue. Von Laue provided uh, the first X-ray diffraction patterns, and he proved in one experiment, one amazing experiment, that X-rays had a wavy nature. Mind you, the year was 1912. For, and the discovery of X-ray were in, nine, in 1895. In 1896, one year after the discovery of X-ray, you could buy an X-ray machine to look at fractured bones. One year later. And then it took 17 years to understand what X-rays were. And von Laue did that. So he showed that X-ray had a wave in Asia, and he also showed that crystals were ordered as people thought before and he got the Nobel in 1914. One year later, the father, Henry Bragg, and the son, Lawrence Bragg, devised the Bragg equation. And they started the science. While von Laue provided the tool, they provided the beginning of the science. And really, the science of crystallography started in uh, the year um, 1913, and next year was supposed to be the year of crystallography after the Bragg, father and son, not this year after von Laue. However, the year of crystallography has been postponed to 1914 for lack of budget. No. Not very scientific. Ada Yonat created, she's a symbol of, of a new era in which 
you do not study the structure of crystals, you study the structure of a molecule by building a crystals from these molecules. And Ada, from here, I'm supposed to be with her in Prague tomorrow, she, she did a wonderful job and, um, and provided us with the uh, information on um, a huge uh, molecule. She did it in a synchrotron, and um, this is a synchrotron that I want to be built in Israel. And uh, Weizmann should have a beam line here, right there. This is the Weizmann beam line. This is Ben Gurion University. This is Teva. If this synchrotron is built in Israel, we'll all be very happy. And I tried to convince the people with the money to do that. Next is myself, and this is the story. And uh, the story is about the discovery of quasi-crystals, of quasi-periodic materials. What you see here is this is the original electron diffraction pattern, and this is how a lattice image looks like. And this is the Nobel of 2011. So, let us start. In the mid-80s, let me take you to the mid-80s. In the mid-80s, there were three surprising discoveries on the structure of matter and its properties. And these three discoveries came year after year, and all these three discoveries received a Nobel later on. The first, chronologically, was the discovery of quasi-periodic crystals, and the names are my name, Ilan Blech, Denis Gratias, and John Kahn. Next is the discovery of fullerens, and next is the discovery of high-temperature superconductivity. Now, when high-temperature superconductivity was discovered, Everybody was happy. There was no objection to the discovery, although people thought before that superconductivity will be up to around 30K. But when high temperature superconductivity, superconductivity was discovered, everybody was happy mainly because now it became practical because liquid nitrogen is quite cheap. And so people had great ideas what to do with high temperature superconductivity and one or two of these ideas have materialized over years. When fullerens were discovered, fullerens are just another way in which a layer, one layer of graphite can fold to form a ball, buckyballs, everybody was happy. Here is another way in which carbon atoms can form, no objection. But when quasi-periodic crystals were discovered, the discovery and explanations met a lot of resistance in the scientific community and in the higher echelons of the scientific community. And I will tell you part of this story as we go along. But before we st really start, uh, let's uh, to say a couple of words about order, periodicity, and rotational symmetry. This is for the students or those of you who are not familiar with these terms. So here we have a, uh, an ordered uh, layer of, uh, of atoms, and clearly it is ordered, and if I ask you to continue it in each and every direction, you will know how to do that. Well, that's about order. Let's bring in a direction. Here is a direction, and if you go along this direction, you also see that there is periodicity here. So that the distance between this and this is equal to the distance from here to here, and so on. And periodicity exists in periodic crystal, as this is. Periodicity exists in each and every direction you go. If you go in this direction, there is periodicity. If you go in this direction, there is periodicity. That's about periodicity. What about rotation and symmetry? Here is the same lattice, only that I have added a handle up here so that you'll see when I rotate it, the position. So you can rotate this uh, lattice 90 degrees. And you get here, and the lattice looks exactly the same. 180 looks the same, 270 looks the same, and 360 still looks the same. So this lattice has a four-fold rotational symmetry. It means that you can rotate it four times, and each time it will look the same. Rotational symmetry can be defined as follows. An image has a rotational symmetry if there is a center point around which the object is tearing a certain number of degrees, and the object still looks the same. That is, it matches itself a number of times while it is being rotated. And here are a few examples. This card has a twofold symmetry, 
threefold the flower, fivefold this pizza has sixfold rotation symmetry. And this is a motif, and the motif can have any rotation symmetry that you want. Now we can skip that. Crystal definition up until 1991 in all textbooks was similar. A crystal may be defined as, this is from a book by Caletti, X-ray diffraction. A crystal is a solid composed of atoms arranged in a pattern periodic in three dimension. So a crystal is ordered and periodic. Another definition, atoms in a crystal that are arranged in a pattern that repeats itself in three dimensions throughout the interior of the crystal. Same definition, different words. A crystal is ordered and periodic. Why so? Because from 1912 until 1982, for 70 years, all crystals that have been studied were ordered and periodic. There was no exception. And there were hundreds of thousands of crystals studied by tens of thousands of eminent crystallographers and nobody saw anything else but crystals that were ordered and periodic. And so these were the definitions. A crystal is ordered and periodic. Crystallography in 1982, which is the year of the discovery, can be, this is an example of the textbook that we studied by Charles Kittel, and I have marked something here in green. I know you cannot see it, but now you can. And it says the following. We can make a crystal from molecules which individually have a five-fold rotation axis, but we should not expect the lattice to have five-fold rotation axis. We should not expect the lattice to have five-fold rotation symmetry because in periodic crystals, and all crystals were periodic, this is forbidden because of geometrical reasons, and I will show you a proof later on why you should not expect the lattice to have a five-fold rotation symmetry. This is what we studied. Now, let's go to the real space of atoms, and this is a high-resolution picture taken by a high-resolution electron microscope of atoms in the diamond. This is a picture that I took many years ago. And in such a uh, crystal, which is ordered and periodic, you can see the periodicity in each and every direction that you go, each and every direction. And the rotation symmetries that are allowed are 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6, no 5, and nothing beyond 6 are allowed in the real space. This is because, as I said, of geometrical reasons. This is in a periodic lattice. No five-fold rotation symmetry and nothing beyond six. Let's now go to the diffraction space, which we call the reciprocal space. Reciprocal space is a mathematical space in which the diffraction peaks exist. And this is an electron diffraction what you see here in this electron diffraction is this center point is the transmitted beam and all the other points are diffracted beam. What we do in an electron microscope, we shine a electron beam on a specimen and we can tilt the specimen and obtain diffraction in each and every direction. Part of the beam goes through, this is a transmitted beam, and all the other beams are diffracted. This happens in the reciprocal space, and here too there is periodicity in the diffraction pattern in each and every direction that you go. You can see the periodicity, much like in the real space, and the rotation symmetries that are allowed are the same, one, two, three, four, six, no five, and nothing beyond six, and that's it. Now. Something happened, and in 1992, a new definition of a crystal has emerged, and this definition was made by the International Union of Crystallography. This is the strict body of mathematical crystallographers who are very, very careful about their decisions and about, their, about any change in our understanding of crystal, and they came with this new definition in 1992, 
And this is a beautiful definition, a very beautiful definition, because it is a humble definition. Let's read it. Let's see what it says. It says the following. By crystal we mean, it doesn't say a crystal is, no. By crystal we mean soft. Any solid having an essentially discrete diffraction diagram. Essentially discrete diffraction diagram. Very, very humble, very open. Let's continue. And by a periodic crystal we mean any crystal in which three-dimensional lattice periodicity can be considered to be absent. A soft definition, a humble definition from this very strict body. This is beautiful because a humble scientist is a good scientist who is willing to listen, who is, who is, whose mind is open. A scientist who doesn't say, the book does not allow it. That's, that's not very good. Open definition. The field is open. Now, 1982 was the 70th birth of crystallography, remember, started in 1912, and this was the year in which quasi periodic crystals were discovered. Let me take you back to my laboratory. Uh, my laboratory was at NBS, National Bureau of Standards. I was there on my sabbatical. It was my first sabbatical from the Technion, as Echiam explained before. But my affiliation salary came from Johns Hopkins University. Physically, I was in, uh, at NBS. And NBS was a wonderful place. They really, I, I like government laboratories in the United States. They really provide means to do good research. Anyway, this is my logbook. And uh, the date on the logbook is April 8, 1982. Of course, this was never meant to be seen by you. It was written only for me, and so it's, it's, it's written in a very sloppy way, in the dark of the electron microscope room. April 8, 1982, the material I was studying was aluminum 25% manganese. It was rapidly solidified, and I studied the phases that form in this material when you rapidly solidify them. And so this is the plate number of the microscope. This is selected area diffraction, 28,000 times magnification, 17,000 times magnification. I come to this plate, 1924. I will show you this plate, 36K, and it was a very interesting image, image of a crystal, of a group of crystals, which was very interesting. And I said to myself, hmm, that's odd. I've never seen anything like that. Let's see what the diffraction pattern looks like. I took the diffraction pattern, tenfold, three question marks. This is a discovery. And in the Nobel Committee, they said that rarely is it possible to trace back a discovery, not only to a certain date, but to the morning of a certain day. This was the morning of April 8, 1982. And this is, this is it. OK, but this was, of course, only the beginning. And then I continued to perform a series of experiments, which I will briefly show you. This string means that everything was done on the same crystal. And here is another crystal. Huh? And this is a drawing of the dark field experiment that I have performed. You don't need to go into details there. This was plate 1724. This is what I saw. Each one of these, this is a single crystal. Looked like a dendrite. This is a single crystal, this is a single crystal, also this and this and this. Look at these black ones. I have never seen such black crystals. When you see a black crystal in a bright field image, it means that the transmitted beam has very, very low intensity. That means that the diffracted beams have very high intensity because the energy goes somewhere. So I said, wow, let's look at the diffraction pattern of this. And this is what it was. So I look at the diffraction pattern. I repeat what happened that morning. I look at it and I say to myself, Ein chaya kazot. I started to count the rotation symmetry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. No, no, cannot be. One, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I write tenfold. You know, it's impossible. But this is. Only one thing that is strange about the diffraction pattern. You see, in this diffraction pattern, 
the periodicity is lost. No periodicity. Look, if you go in this direction, you take the distance from here to here, you multiply it by any integer, say 2, you get here. And there is nothing there. No periodicity. Well, turns out that the ratio of distances from here to here divided by this is an irrational number. Of course, you cannot do it by measuring and dividing. This should come from theory. And so this is the uh, Fibonacci number, this ratio, which is this number here. 1 plus root 5 divided by 2, which is an irrational number. So irrational numbers came into crystallography and tenfold symmetry and no periodicity and everything is on one diffraction pattern. Okay, so I said to myself, well, this must be a series of twins in a periodic material, and I'll tell you why. But before doing that, let's look at the diffraction patterns. This is the fivefold or tenfold. By the way, it is not tenfold as you saw, it is fivefold, but I couldn't say that by looking at the diffraction pattern. I had to take what is known as Kikuchi pattern, and on the Kikuchi pattern you see that it is fivefold. So what you can do, as I said, in the microscope, you tilt your specimen and you rotate it to get all these diffraction patterns, and we have five to five, so the fivefold was not a single axis, five to five, and five, three, two, three. These are the rotation symmetries, and these are the angles. So this provides us with a symmetry series, which is icosahedral, and this is why I call the phase the icosahedral phase later on. So this is icosahedral symmetry. Now, let's uh, like take a little break and I'll take you back to the Technion when I was a student there, when I did my master's degree. I took a class of uh, crystallography and in the exam, in the final exam, one of the questions was prove that five-fold rotational symmetry cannot exist in crystals. And here is one proof. I proved it, I passed the test. This is why I'm here. <laughs> passed the exam, thanks God. So here is a proof. In order to prove that five-fold rotational symmetry is not allowed in crystals, as they said then, now we know it's not allowed in periodic crystals, there are other crystals. In order to do that, let's take two atoms, P and Q, and choose two atoms which are closest together. So the distance R is the shortest distance between two atoms in that lattice. And now if five-fold rotational symmetry is allowed, then we can rotate Q around P five times and P around Q five times. And let's see what happens when we do that. So here's Q, one, two, three, four, and five. And there should be a Q prime atom here if five-fold rotation symmetry is allowed. Let's do it to P, one, two, three, four, five. And there should be a P prime atom here. But because of geometrical reasons, the distance Q prime, P prime is shorter than Q prime, P prime, Q prime here, I'm sorry, between Q and P here. And this is impossible because we chose the shortest distance between two atoms. Okay. No five-fold rotation symmetry. But there is a pseudo five-fold rotation symmetry, and this is an interesting picture. This is an image taken also by electron microscopy of a crystal that is found in the aluminum iron system. And I took these pictures in the 70s, many years before the discovery. One of the first pictures I ever took after I completed my uh, PhD. Now, this is a periodic crystal, but there are 10 of them. Right here, down here, it's a periodic crystal. Here is another one, here is another one. If you count them, there are 10 altogether. This is very common in the aluminum iron system. What's special about these crystals is that they are twin related. So between this and this, there is a twin boundary. Twin boundary is a, is a mirror boundary, and planes from uh, this crystal have a mirror image in the other crystal. So this is a twin boundary. I'll show you later on a uh, lattice image of something like that. Now, if you take a diffraction pattern from one of these crystals, then of course you will receive a periodic diffraction pattern. Nothing new. However, because you have 10 different crystals here, 
and the difference between their, the, 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 the angle between them is 36 degrees, 360 divided by 10. And if you take a diffraction pattern from all of them together, then you will have 10 diffraction patterns superimposed, and each one is 36 degrees to the other. So you'll have one, two, three, four, five, ten of them. And of course, you'll have a tenfold rotation symmetry, which is shown here. But this diffraction pattern is a pseudo five or tenfold rotation symmetry because each spot here is, give, is, contribu the con is contributed, is given by another crystal. This spot comes from one crystal, this spot comes from another one, from another one, and it looks very beautiful tenfold, but it's really pseudo tenfold. It's not a single crystal, it's a twinned crystal. Okay. So, since I took that uh, in my early years, and I, by the way, it's an interesting story. When I found this crystal and did a little analysis, I never published it because it, it looks so trivial. What, what is there to publish? Very trivial. Last year, in Sweden, I met a couple of crystallographers who told me that they published five papers on this thing here. Duffman Kennan, as they say in Swedish. Okay, so this is what I thought, and I was looking for the twins. Here's just one. Here's another uh, lattice image of uh, five-fold twins. This is in diamond. This is also abundant, and here you can see the atomic plane. Each one of these is a uh, is a mirror image. Is a mirror uh, plane. It's a mirror boundary. So if you follow this line or this plane of atoms, here is this plane of atoms. So this is a mirror, and here's another mirror. There are five twins here, and we shall skip the sigma notations now. So <coughs> then I said, okay, these are obviously twins. Let's find the twins. In order to find the twins. You can perform several experiments in the microscope. One of them is called a series of dark field images, as it is seen here. A dark field image is something like that. You see, when you take a bright field image, you use the central spot, you block all the other beams, and you take a picture using this beam. This is called a bright field image. A dark field image is when you use another, a one of the diffracted beams, say this diffracted beam, you block out all other beams by an aperture, and you take the image that of the crystal, and all the parts that contribute to this, to this diffracting spot will be shining here. And if this was given by one twin, then a little part here will shine, and all the rest will be dark. But that didn't happen, all the crystal was shining here, and using this, everything, it was shining. So, no twins. Hmm, now it's becoming really strange. So, I said to myself, well, one more experiment. Another experiment that you can do in the microscope, by the way, an electron microscope is a very, very powerful tool, an amazingly powerful tool. Here I use just a little bit of the capabilities. Microdiffraction is the following. You take the beam, electron beam, you converge it onto a spot, to a small spot, and you hit the uh, specimen your, uh, by this small spot, like this. And now you can move your specimen under the beam. Now, the beam is very small, and in this case it was about 40 micron, uh, 40 nanometers, I'm sorry. And if the, if the twins are larger than 40 nanometer, then in every time I will hit just one of them, one single crystal, and I will have a periodic diffraction pattern. But this didn't happen. Anywhere I moved under the beam, this was a diffraction pattern. Okay? So if there are twins there that are smaller than 40 microns or even less than that, very unlikely. No twins. Hmm. This is another experiment which was done by colleagues of mine. I didn't do that because I did not have a high-resolution microscope at the time, but my friends in France had those uh, horrible, terribly big microscopes, one million volts microscope, three million volt microscope. They were dinosaurs, but they gave lattice imaging. And so here is a lattice image of, uh, of the icosahedral phase, 
and they performed the following experiment. They took a diffraction pattern, and here is a diffraction pattern. Okay, you are familiar with that. They did something else also. They put this on a slide and took a laser beam and put through the slide. And then they received an optical diffraction. And this is the optical diffraction. So the symmetry here and the symmetry here is the same. And you may say, okay, big deal. Of course it's the same. Both are Fourier transform of this image. Oh, so they should look the same. Yes. However, they did something else too. They took an aperture and took this image from this area only. And they made the aperture smaller and smaller. This image did not change. It disappeared, of course, for lack of information, but it didn't change. Okay? Final proof on the atomic scale, no twins. Here is a more modern picture of quasi-periodic crystal. And you can see those beautiful tenfold motifs, and there is no periodicity. 1983, in the summer, I came back to the Technion, end of two years of sabbatical. I knew what I did not have. I didn't have twins. I had all the information arranged, but I did not have a model that could explain what I have in my hand. And Ilan Blech was the first person who joined force, and he proposed a model that could explain how such materials, how such crystals could have been formed. His uh, model is called now the Alcasahedral glass model. And he gave me enough courage to send a paper for publication, and we sent a paper for publication, the two of us, to Journal of Applied Physics. Journal of Applied Physics received our paper. At that time, we sent papers by, with envelopes and stamps, remember? And the, the answer came very, very quickly. Uh, they sent back the paper uh, with a letter from the editor saying that this paper will not interest the community of physicists. Why don't you send it to a metallurgical journal? So I sent it to a metallurgical journal. At that time, I was again in the summer of 1984. I was in, at Nice for the summer. I was used to go there every summer. And I sent it to a journal called Metallurgical Transactions of Metallurgists. And they published it. So this is the paper they published. But they published it months later, deep into 1985. And it was a, short, a, a slow, regular publication. In the meantime, I showed our paper uh, to John Kahn, who was my host at NBS. John Kahn is an eminent uh, thermodynamics of material person in, well known in the world. He was my host. I showed the paper to him and I said, John, what, why do you think it was rejected so swiftly? John read the paper, came back to me, we had some arguments, some discussions, and then he said, okay, Danny, we have something fantastic in our hand. Why don't we publish something much shorter, much quicker? And one of my dreams was to have a paper with John Kahn, so here we are. And we wrote a paper that uh, Yeah, we wrote another paper without the Ilan Blech model, but Ilan Blech was one of the authors, I insisted on that, and we sent it to PRL, Physical Review Letters. It was accepted immediately and published within a month. And when this paper was published in 1984, November 12th, hell broke loose because it started a new era in crystallography and young, avant-garde, eminent scientists reacted immediately, mainly physicists, and mainly in France and in other places. Another name on this paper is that of, uh, of Denis Gratias. Denis Gratias is a mathematical crystallographer, and John Kahn, who was not a crystallographer, brought him in to support uh, my findings. And everything was fine, and the field started with this publication. Now, let's say a few words about icosahedral symmetry. This is an icosahedron. The icosahedron has six uh, five-fold axes. If you look from here to the center of the icosahedron, you see five-fold rotation symmetry. There are six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six. This one here is just the negative of that. So six of these, 10 threefold. Here is the threefold. If you look from here, 
to the center, you see three-fold rotational symmetry, and there are 15 two-folds. If you look from this bar, center bar, center of the bar to the center of the icosahedron, they will have a two-fold rotational symmetry. So the diffraction patterns that I had had icosahedral symmetry. This is why we called it the icosahedral phase. Now, some people would like to see these symmetries on an easier, Im or easier body, and this is a football. And uh, clearly, you can see that there is five-fold rotational symmetry here, two-fold here, and three-fold here. A football has an icosahedral symmetry, and I suspect that the football players do not know that. <laughs> so, now let's talk about quasi-periodicity. And to talk about quasi-periodicity, we need to start with the number one mathematician uh, of his time, Leonardo Fibonacci de Pisa. And this is uh, Mr. Fibonacci when he was young. And this is a statue on his graveyard. And his grave is uh, just behind the inclined tower of Pisa. Uh, there's, there's a, a graveyard under a roof, and he, he's buried there. A great mathematician. Now, to understand quasi-periodicity from the very beginning, let's talk a little bit about Fibonacci rabbits. So these are the Fibonacci rabbits, and what do we have here? He provided us with two rules how to build this series. Rule number one, a female rabbit, well, a male comes to visit her and goes away. But so she's pregnant, and in the second month, she gives birth to a little one. And every month, she will give birth to a little one. And a little one has to grow up one month to mature one month before it can reproduce. These are the two rules. That's all there is to it. So in the third month, this mother gives birth to a little one. This one grows up, matures. In the fourth month, this mother gives birth to a little one. This one matures. And this one gives birth to a little one. That's all there is to it. On the left, you can see the number of rabbits in each and every month. So this is it. So what do we have? Well, there are several rules and several conclusions, but let's talk about a couple of them, and then of the, about the most important one. So rule number one, the number of rabbits in each given month equals the sum of the rabbits in the two previous months. So 5 is 2 plus 3, 13 is 5 plus 8, 13 plus 21 will give us 34, 34 plus 31 will give us 55, and you can continue the series wherever you want to go. Okay, so this is one. Rule number two, if you go to infinity, n when n is a very large number, then the ratio of the number of rabbits within, within a given month to that in the previous month will give you the irrational number uh, tau, which is a Fibonacci number, one plus root five divided by two, and this is the irrational number. And Mr. Fibonacci published it in the year 1202. This is 810 years ago. But what about quasi-periodicity? Well, let's look here. Look at the rabbits. Large, small, large, large, small, large, small, large, large, small, large, large, small, large, small, large, large, small. There is no motif that repeats itself ever in this series. There is no motif of any size that repeats itself in this series. This is a quasi-periodic series in one dimension. Yeah? Just one dimension. So this is quasi-periodicity, and he started it. What about two-dimensional quasi-periodicity? Penrose styles. Penrose is an eminent scientist living in our time, physicist, mathematician, everything. Uh, he's British, he lives in our time, and uh, he devised those Penrose tiles. Penrose found two tiles, a thin rhombus and a thick rhombus, that can tile a uh, two-dimensional space without gaps in a quasi-periodic way. There is no periodicity. There is no motif that repeats itself. Now, another, um, another scientist named Ellen Mackay, also living in our time, He's also British. He took Penrose tiles, put them on a slide, and put a laser beam through them, and lo and behold, sharp refraction spots appear. 
Of course, nowadays, you do it on the computer within a fraction of a second from the image to the Fourier transform diffraction pattern. You do it on the computer, it's called FFT, fast Fourier transform. But he did it as we did it before with the laser beam. And he found that Penrose tides will give sharp diffraction spots in the reciprocal space. This is not trivial because it's not periodic. Three dimensions. Quasi periodicity in three dimensions. Here's a crystal taken by Ina Popov from my laboratory years ago. So, this is a quasi periodic crystal, and the composition is magnesium zinc cerium. And you can clearly see the beautiful fivefold facet. So, this is in three dimensions. So, we have one dimension quasi periodicity, two dimensions, three dimensions quasi periodicity. <coughs> now, let me show you something interesting. <coughs> what you can do is the following. You can take a periodic array in a high dimensional space. In this case, a two dimensional space. Make a cut in this periodic array and make a projection and create a quasi periodic series in a lower dimensional space. I will show you. I know that I'm not clear. I will show you. So here we have a uh, periodic. Um, structure or periodic array, and in each intersection there is a point without dimension, a mathematical point, no dimensions. And now you can make a cut. This strip is a cut through the, uh, the two-dimensional periodic lattice. This is a cut, and I have sent it not in just any direction, but the tangent, tangent of alpha I have chosen to be the Fibonacci number tau. Now, when I do that, it means the following. It means that if I start at a lattice point here in the periodic structure, this line will never, ever meet any other point. Of course, because if it did meet, then the tangent would be a rational number. Let's say that it meets the point here. Then the tangent is this divided by this, which is a rational number. But I chose it to be an irrational number, the tangent. OK, so now what we can do is take all the points which are within the strip and project them onto the line. And see what happened. We have created a series here of distances, large, large, small, large, large, small, large, small, large. Hey, Fibonacci. So what did we do? We took a higher dimensional space, just two dimensional space, made a cut in it, and it is periodic, made a cut, project, and recreated a quasi-periodic array in a lower dimensional space. And you can do it from six dimensional space to three dimensional space. And then you create a, uh, a quasi-periodic crystal. Whether it exists in nature or not, it's a different story. But, but it can be there. Now, let me show you something else, which is quite interesting. This is what I did before. This is the irrational direction. But now I bring in the red lines. The red lines are very close to the black lines, very, very close. But I chose them to be in, an, in another tangent, another direction, and they do meet this point here. The, the red line meets this point here. It starts here, and it meets this point here. Now, when I did that, I have created the tangent of this angle is a rational number, because they meet. And I've chosen it to be 11 divided by 7. If you count the points here, this is 11 divided by 7. So I, this, is, this is periodic. Now, crystals which are built on the black line are quasi-periodic crystals. Crystals that are built on the red lines are periodic crystals. And clearly, you see the periodicity. Here is one point, here is another point, and there will be one there, and more and more. This is periodicity. But this crystal, the red line, is very, very close to the black line. Crystals built this way are called approximants. This is a, a, this is a large series of crystals that are approximately quasi-periodic, but not quite. They are periodic, with high periodicity, large periodicity. So, these are the approximants, and this is a whole field and there are many scientists who study uh, 
quasi, we study the approximant nowadays. Okay, enough of that. Now let's do the story. The discovery that was made in 1982, and we wrote the paper in 1984. Now, in 1982, I started to show my diffraction patterns to everybody who was willing to listen, and this was at NBS, but also I was stupid enough to send these diffraction patterns as Christmas cards to each and everybody and his wife. <laughs> and nobody did anything with that. But the reaction at, at NBS was something like that. John Kahn, my host, was positive. He said, Danny, this material is telling us something, and I challenge you to find out what it is. This was a good reaction. The bad side was that my group leader came one day to my office, smiling sheepishly, putting a book on my desk, and saying, Danny, please read this book, X-ray Diffraction, and you will know that what you, have, what you are saying cannot be. And I said to him, you know, I, I know this book, I teach at the Technion, I don't need to read it, I'm telling you, my material is not in the book. Took the book back, came back a couple days later and said, Danny, I don't want you in my group, you are a disgrace to my group, I don't want to be associated with you, please leave my group. So I left his group. Now, it was not as traumatic as it sounds, because all it meant was to find another group leader who would adopt me, which I did, uh, to adopt the uh, scientific orphan, and he took me to his group. Practically, all it meant was instead of reporting to this secretary, I reported to this secretary. That was the difference. But the feeling was of that of rejection, and all the other reactions were something in between John Kahn and that group leader, sort of on the negative side. And if you want to know how I felt during that period, it's something like that. <laughs> so this was until the publication. 1984, 1984, when Ilan Blair joined, for the first time I was not alone. And we published that paper. And then the field started. And my colleagues around the world took the discovery and made it a science. So now we had not only the discovery of quasi-periodic materials, we had a science of quasi-periodic materials, and that community grew in a very fast rate. So you would think that that's the end. Not so fast. Because the main body who agrees or doesn't agree about anything in crystallography did not accept quasi-periodic crystals or quasi-periodic materials, and that body was the International Union of Crystallographers. Now, why didn't they accept it? Although the evidence came from each and every direction. Everybody that repeated my experiments agreed. This is because of the tradition. You see, when von Laue and Bragg created the science of X-ray crystallography, the X-ray crystallographers distinguished themselves from the primitive geologists who thought they knew how crystals are built by measuring angles between facets in crystals. This was crystallography before X-rays. Many people measured angles between crystals and said, well, if the crystal is cubic, probably the structure is cubic, and so on. So, once X-ray crystallographer had the tool, they said, well, we are X-ray crystallographers. We have a scientific tool, and a precision scientific tool, not like them. And the science was called X-ray crystallography, nothing else. When I came, and my colleagues came, with electron microscopy results, they did not accept it. They said, bring us X-ray diffraction result, allow a pattern, and then we can talk. Now, in order to take a lower pattern by X-rays of a crystal, you need a crystal of some size. Our crystals were two microns in size. You cannot take a two micron crystal and put a laser, a, an X-ray beam through it and get a lower pattern. You need a larger crystal. How large? Something that you can feel between your fingers, a fraction of a millimeter. And it took us three years to grow such crystals, knowing the composition. It took us three years. 
My colleagues from France and from Japan in 1987 sent me the following picture. This is, here is an example. This is a lower pattern, and this was from Japan. This is a lower pattern taken from, the, uh, I, from an icosahedral phase, zinc, magnesium, holmium, quasi-periodic material. I took these slides and showed them in the International Union of Crystallography meeting in Perth, Australia, in the summer of 1987. And when I presented this picture, the community said, OK, Danny, now you're talking. They created a committee, of, and that committee uh, redefined crystals, and you have seen the definition before. That is the humble definition. That happened in 1987. Game over? Not so fast. Because there was still a large resistance from a large community, and it was the, uh, the flag carrier of that resistance was Professor Linus Pauling. Now, Professor Linus Pauling was a most eminent chemist of the um, 20th century, really. Nobel Prize twice, chemistry and peace. He was a flamboyant speaker, as I'm sure that the old generation here saw him in different meetings. He was a, he was a speaker like, like a politician, like Begin was. He stood like that. <laughs> and he was not alone. He was the godfather of the American Chemical Society that counts hundreds of thousands of members. And they all supported old Linus, of course. How can you support that Danny Sherpa? So, the resistance was led by him, but it was followed by very many scientists. Now, I met him several times. I gave him a talk for one audience. We had dinners together. We agreed about everything, vitamin C included, but never about quasi-periodic materials. A couple years before he died, he died in 1994. A couple years before he died, he sent me a letter. We corresponded. That letter said, Professor Schechtman, let us write the joint paper, the Schechtman polling paper, and you will be the first, on quasi-periodic materials. Huh. I answered him with a letter, remember, envelope, stamps? Professor Pauling, I'll be delighted to have this paper with you, but before we even start, we should agree that quasi-periodic materials do exist. He wrote me a letter back saying, well, that may be too early for that. <laughs> and then, and then a couple of years later, he died in 1994, and that was the end of the res resistance and quasi-periodicity and quasi-periodic materials are accepted by everybody. Now, I want to mention a few names who really contributed seminal contribution to the very be beginning of the field. Roger Penrose, Elena Mackay, I told you about them. Roger Penrose with Penrose tiles and Elena Mackay with the diffraction of the Penrose tiles. That was important. Ilan Blech, Denis Gratis, and John Kahn, who joined forth with me to publish the second paper who was published first. And Dovlevin and Paul Steinhardt. Dovlevin is now a professor at Technion. Paul Steinhardt is a professor in Princeton. They proposed a tiling model, tiling like Penrose tiles to explain quasi-periodic materials. And this is the accepted model uh, today. Now, here is something funny. In 1986, down here, 1986, a colleague of mine, Bob Schaefer, I was again in the summer, this is July. In July, I was at NBS. He came with this drawing that he did on a piece of paper, and I confiscated it, and this is why you can see that. He did the following. N is the number of pages in the bibliography. So each page less, maybe contains 25 papers or so. so this is 1 over n. 0.1 means 10, that n is 10, that means 250 papers, and so on and so forth. And he drew this line. He, see, he uh, marked x with the number of papers according to the month. So in February, we had so many, and so on, and so on, and so on. And in July, we had so many. And as a good scientist, he connected them with a straight line. And we realized that in December of 1986, the number of papers on quasi-periodic materials will reach infinity. <laughs> well, that didn't happen. <laughs> but 
The feeling was that the world is exploding with activity. Unbelievable explosion. Okay. This is just a pretty picture, that, but, uh, but it's nice because, and, and the, the colors are artificial. It was taken in a scanning microscope by Anpeng Tsai, the colour of mine. But these are quasi-periodic crystals in the aluminum manganese uh, system, 14% manganese, by the way. Look here, look at the five-fold rotation symmetry here and here. This is the three-fold, beautiful picture. Okay, so I would like to finish by a couple of things. Number one, the conclusion, the paradigm shift. What was the paradigm shift? This was the paradigm shift. While before, order was synonym to periodicity, now order is periodic and quasi-periodic, and it is open-ended. If somebody will come with another discovery, we are listening. The community is listening. I want to ask you a question and answer, and this will be the end. Why quasi-periodic materials were never discovered before 1982? You see, crystallography, experimental crystallography started 70 years later, and for 70 years nobody saw any quasi-periodic material, and, and hundreds of thousands of crystals were studied by tens of thousands of eminent scientists for 70 years, and nobody saw any quasi-periodic crystal? Is it because they are very rare? Okay, maybe. Is it because they are not stable? You touch them, they transform. Is it because they are difficult to make? Or maybe they are made of very esoteric materials? Well, number one, they are not rare at all. There are hundreds of quasi-periodic materials, hundreds and hundreds of them. Here is a partial list of quasi-periodic composition based on aluminum alone, and there are many that are based on other elements, not rare. This is not the reason why they were not discovered. Maybe they're not stable? Well, many indeed are not stable, but what does it mean, not stable? It means that if you take them and you heat them up to 350 degrees C, 400 degrees C, then they will transform to a periodic phase. But at room temperature, they are stable, no problem. And then there are also um, quite a few compositions which melt congruently. It means that they are stable until the melting point. All right. So this is not the reason. So, maybe they are difficult to make. And I, with my magic hands, managed to make one. Not at all. They are very easy to make. You can make them by casting. You can make them by rapid solidification. You can make them by single crystal growth. Electro deposition, CVD, PVD. Any way you make metallic alloys, you can make quasi-periodic crystal. It's easy to make. They are made of cheap materials. We talk about aluminum, iron, copper, nickel. Ah, nothing. So what is it? So why quasi-periodic materials were never discovered before 1982? Let me give you my answer. From now on, it's subjective. My answer is the following. It has several steps to it. Number one, TM. Transmission electron microscope. Quasi-periodic materials had to be discovered by TAM. They could not have been discovered by any other um, diffraction tool because they were very small. And for TAM, every crystal is a single crystal, as small as it is. So, it had to be discovered by TAM. Okay, this limits the number of researchers who use only those who use TM. It's a smaller number, much smaller number. But that's not enough. When you work on a TM, you have to be a professional. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because there is a sorry story around the world. I can tell you what happened at the Technion. At the Technion, many, many hundreds of students used the electron microscope over the years, doing their master's degree, doing their PhD. Hundreds of them. And you know how many electron microscopies we have produced over the years? Over about 40 years. Maybe 10. Maybe 10 professionals. It's, it's a sad story. And this is true all over the world. Very few professional electron microscopies emerge in the community. And when you do, this, when you discover something, it's not enough to 
work on a TM. It's not enough that you have a driver's license on the TM. You have to be a professional. This limits the number even further. And then tenacity. Okay, you stumble upon something. What do you do with it? Don't let go. You see something strange, something extraordinary. In most cases, it will be an artifact. But it just in some cases, it's a great discovery. Don't let go. Just grab onto it. Why am I saying that? Let me tell you a little story. There is at least one person in the world who saw that five or tenfold diffraction pattern before me. How do I know that? His professor told me. A country in Europe, a professor looks at the slides of an electron microscope that were taken many years before, and whoops, one of them is my slide taken before me by one of his students. Now a PhD for many years is a manager somewhere. He calls him and he said, hello my students. Do you know that you saw the tenfold diffraction pattern of Danny Shechman before him? The students said, yes professor, I know. He said, why didn't you tell me? He said the student, well you see professor, if I told you, you would want me to stay for two more years on my PhD? <laughs> Don't let go. Don't let go if you discover something which is strange and different. You have to believe in yourself. And you believe in yourself if you are a professional. In whatever subject. So this is the key word. And this is what I say to young people around the world. If you want to succeed in your career, become a professional in something that you like. Find something that you like. But try to be number one in your group, in your school, then in your country, then in the world. Try to be excellent, try to be an expert. And if you're an expert, it will, you'll have a wonderful career, I tell them. I promise you, you'll have a wonderful career if you're an expert. But try to find something that you like. It need not be science. You want to be a saxophone player? Wonderful, but try to be number one. And last but not least, is sometimes you have courage, you have to have courage. Um, Facing rejection is not, is not nice, is not nice. But if you are a professional and, you know, I tested my results several times, time and again. I repeated these experiments and I convinced myself, and I'm my worst critic, I convinced myself that I'm correct. No problem, I'm right. And once I convinced myself, of course, I'm open to criticism. But all the criticism came from theoreticians. They said that cannot be. No. Science is basically experimental. Look at the Nobel Prizes. Most of them are for experiments. Discoveries are made by experiments, mostly. Yeah, theory is very important. But if you're an experimentalist and some and theoretician tells you that cannot be, I don't listen to that. I want, if another experimentalist tells me, I repeated your experiments, and let me show you where you made a mistake. I am all ears. I'm listening. But a theoretician that tells me that that cannot be? No. So sometimes you have to have courage. Uh, my promotion at the Technion was denied when the world was exploding already with, with quasi-periodic uh, investigators. And uh, this was a promotion from a senior lecturer to an associate professor. So sometimes you have to stand tall. Enough of this story. Thank you very much.